Now, we're going to get on with our first talk. And our first talk is uh, about government services and, and digital and, and online stuff of the government. Now, I think in Estonia, this is something we take for granted. We have a small country, a relatively small government. It's relatively, relatively agile, and we're used to e-Estonia. We're used to all our government services. But there are a lot of countries in the world where the bureaucracy in the government is much larger, much more entrenched, and it takes a lot more work to kind of change the system. So we're going to have some experts uh, from the UK government. So without much further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Kate Ivy Williams and Martin Jordan. Would you like to come up here, guys? Welcome. Please give them a round of applause. Hi. Oh. Hey. hey. Welcome. <laughs> Cheers. Got my Britney mic on. I feel very special. Um, so, hi. Hi. Hello. Where's our slides? All right, wait. There we are. Um, so I'm Kate, obviously. And I'm Martin, hi. Um, and we are gonna talk a bit about how designers help make government better for everyone. Um, so we are from the UK's Government Digital Service. Um, hands up, who's heard of GDS before? Hmm, quite some hands, nice. Some, not too many, so it's gonna be interesting for a lot of you, hopefully. And hopefully it'll be some new things for those of you who've heard of us already. And we're going to talk a bit about what GDS is uh, in the UK to do um, and what we do. And then a bit about how we do it and how, as designers working in government, how designers do what we do. Um, so first of all, a bit about what we're for. Uh, this is us, some of us. There are actually about 400 of us in total. Um, and we are a team of designers, developers, user researchers, uh, data analysts, writers, and more. Uh, we were set up back in 2011, and we are part of the British government. We're part of a department called the Cabinet Office, which is central government, and we work in this building. It looks very important. It's called Aviation House in London. Um, and we work with the rest of government to help them make digital services better. Um, so that doesn't just mean designing websites, um, but it means improving the relationship that citizens have with government um, to make things better for people who use government services, which is pretty much everyone in the UK. If you don't, you're probably a bit of a hermit. Um, and we've been quite successful, at least, um, David, our former Prime Minister, thinks so. Um, he said that he thinks setting up government digital service is one of the greatest unsung triumphs of the last parliament. Thanks, David. Um, <laughs> and here are some of the things that we do. Uh, so we built gov.uk. Uh, it's one website for all of government. We make common components that can be used by other government um, departments to build things, so things like gov.uk pay, which is a payments platform that all of government can use, uh, gov, uh, gov.uk notify, which is um, a notifications platform that can send text messages, emails, and even letters, um, <laughs> and verify, which is a way of proving who you are online so that you can access government services, so that you can do things like apply for benefits or file your tax return. Um, and this is the, one of the first platform elements we built, and it's really important because the government in the UK doesn't have one big database. We don't have identity cards. We don't have a big database that holds data on every single citizen. So we use third parties to verify who the citizens are, and then they can come back and start using those services. It's much safer, and um, it's a way around that issue. Um, and we help to transform government services. Um, and by a service, we basically mean something that helps people to do something, often based around life events, like um, starting a business, or learning to drive, or registering the birth of a child, becoming a citizen. Uh, but f before we get into all of that, um, Martin's going to take you through a bit of history. Yes, history lesson. So <laughs> I'd like to explain you a bit like how and why we do these things and how we uh, made progress. Um, and so I'd like to take you back to a time before GDS uh, came into being. So this is direct gov. Looks a bit 
old. Um, so back in um, 2010, this was the main British government website, and it was run in a very old-fashioned manner, if you like. So there were basically major updates and releases every six months, and content was controlled by um, department, uh, de de departmental teams, and simply making like, small updates um, was very, very time-consuming, so, and what's more, um, simply it did not meet user needs, citizens' needs. Um, so finding things was really hard, and there were lots of, lots of stuff that nobody ever looked at. Um, and alongside um, Direct Gov, uh, there were loads of other governmental websites, as you can see here in these thumbnails. So with more than 300 departments and agencies in the British government, um, most of them had their own separate website, and they were all different. So as you can see, it, it was a bit of a mess, to be honest. <laughs> um, so we've been replacing all these websites, there's hundreds of websites, with just one, and this is gov.uk, and which basically means having a lot, instead of having a lot of different pages um, with this information, um, we've been bringing everything into one website containing all the information. Um, and this may sound simple, right? But of course it is not. <laughs> Um, things are rarely simple in government, especially in such a big government. Yeah. Hashtag bureaucracy. Yes. Um, so it took a lot of hard work. And um, in a matter of fact, uh, since the 1990s, a lot of people in government have been trying to work on this and figure it out, um, but they simply um, were not having a mandate. Um, so by um, 2010, the internet had become really uh, part of the fabric of the nation, but it was less so um, part of the fabric of government. Um, and there were quite a few people recognizing that. Uh, but one key person uh, was Martha Lane Fox. This is Martha. Um, she's an internet entrepreneur. She set up lastminute.com, and today she's on the board of Twitter. Um, and she had also been appointed as the UK government digital um, inclusion champion, uh, which basically means that she had a lot of influence in government. And she was one of the people um, who could actually bring change. Um, so Francis Maud, who was then the minister um, for the cabinet office, he asked Martha to review or to write a review of uh, Direct Gov, um, the old orangey um, government website we saw. And um, well, she wrote a review, and this is what you can see here. It's 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 an old-fashioned 11-page letter, um, and you will notice the title. Uh, it says "Revolution, not Evolution." Um, and she wasn't basically going beyond the brief, luckily for us. Um, and yeah, she asked, uh, she said, like, you asked me to oversee a strategic review of direct gov, but I have not reviewed direct gov in isolation, but as part of how government, um, how the government can use the internet to both communicate and interact better with citizens. And then um, Francis Mort, this is him, um, he read this letter and then did something that ministers rarely do. He said, yes. <laughs> and this basically gave us the mandate and GS was born. Um, so it starts um, with gov.uk. So we built gov.uk. It uh, has become a central website, the central website um, for government. Um, it's home to 24 uh, uh, ministerial uh, departments and 331 um, public bodies and other agencies, including things like the Charity Commission and so on. And each week, um, gov.uk has more than 10 million visitors. And um, since two um, 2012, we had over 2 billion um, visits. We and got cake for that. That was good. Oh, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, and this is the earliest picture uh, we were able to um, find of the thing that uh, became gov.uk. It's a sketch drawn by Richard Pope. He was a developer on the, on the alpha team developing that. And note the name. It says um, ukgov.gov.uk. Oh. <laughs> scary, right? <laughs> but you can as well see the big search box. And we still have that. And then there's a gray thing on top, which is an ad banner. Oh. Luckily, we do not have that. <laughs> Only um, an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Emergency. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now, of course, um, Gov.uk looks like that. It's really part of the UK's national infrastructure. And the thing is, it's not finished, and it never will be. Um, 
we are always iterating, always changing, improving the thing. Um, and what's important here is um, Gov.uk uh, is made in a, in a way no government website has been built before. Um, so instead, uh, government websites used to be procured, commissioned, or bought. Um, so they were built and, and basically delivered and handed over, thrown over the fence, and like finished, here you go. Um, and of course, like this, this doesn't work, right? Things die of neglect eventually. So at GDS, we work in a different way. Um, and yeah, to all of you in startups, it might be familiar. Um, we work in an agile fashion with multidisciplinary teams. We iterate a lot. So we're not an outside agency. We're part of central government, as Kate said earlier. And we work with all governmental departments um, and these agencies to help make things better for users. And we very purposefully say users, not customers, because citizens are not able to choose. Um, so they users rely on um, government services. Um, and we, as civil servants, have the duty to make these services simpler and clearer and faster to use. So as well as setting up GovUK, uh, we ran a few other parallel projects. Um, one of them was looking at fixing government technology. And by technology, we mean all of the stuff that civil servants use to do their job. So the machines that they're using, uh, the hosting, uh, government Wi-Fi is still awful. We're carrying on working on it. Uh, all sorts of things. Um, and it, it might not sound that glamorous, but it's massively important because for people to deliver great government services, they need the right equipment to do that. Um, and actually, Francis Maud, good old Francis, he thinks that this is actually one of the most important things that we've done. And when asked if he would have done any, anything differently um, during his time with GDS, he said that he would have moved more quickly to improve IT for civil servants. Um, we also started to steer away um, government from big IT um, to st sort of stop government outsourcing the strategy and control of its technology. Um, and we sort of really worked to stop government um, procuring things that didn't focus on user needs. So it, it doesn't mean that big IT companies can't work for government. It just means we've leveled the playing field so that they're smaller and more agile cousins um, are equal, have an equal opportunity to work with us. Um, and the most important thing that we ask is that they focus on user needs. And if they can't do that, then we don't procure them. Um, and we also embarked on a transformation program, uh, which was looking at how citizens interact with government. Um, and transformation meant sending specialists out into departments from GDS all over the UK. Um, and we kicked off discoveries, and we moved them from alpha to beta to live. And there was about 25 projects in total. Um, and we'll dig into, a, into two of them, just to give you a bit more of a flavor of, of what that meant. So one of the first examples we've chosen is carer's allowance, which is um, sort of monetary support for people who are caring for someone um, for over 35 hours a week, if that person is receiving certain benefits. So if someone is staying at home to care for a disabled relative, for example, they can apply to carer's allowance. Um, so we worked with um, the Carers Allowance Unit, which is based up in the north of England, in Preston, and we helped them to build a digital service. And there was probably about 50 people from GDS involved in this project. Um, and rather than me talking about it, I'm going to play a little video that um, there's the people who actually worked on it talking about the work that they did. Have we got sound? Oh. Tech team, sound. <laughs> uh, of course, we tested this two we times. We twisted it twice. <laughs> okay. I know where the problem might be. Uh oh. Ooh. Awkward. <laughs> Tweet or something? I don't know. <laughs> you know all this, right? Like, <laughs> yay!
Carers Allowance is a benefit that's provided to people who are really deserving in society. These are people who are looking after friends and family that are, are very ill, in some cases terminally ill, and it's providing them with uh, an income to help support the cost of caring for that individual. When having to deal with all these problems and all the other strife that's going on in their lives, being able to claim Carers Allowance should be the least of their worries. The new service is to enable people to claim carer's allowance online which is a much quicker and easier process than using the paper form. We've been able to remove 170 questions from the process, that's 49% and we've done that because we've challenged the way that um, the policy has been interpreted on the claim form. Make sure that the customer can understand and progress through the claim giving us the right information to make a quick decision on their application. We've simplified things and cut things back to just the bare information that customers need and we've done that via our user testing and research. The service would not be up and running without the user research and to make sure that the participants, the carers, voice is at the heart of everything that we do. We've had people, less confident users, who buy you know, by the time they get from the start of the claim through to the end, you can see them, that they say this, like, that's so much better than I expected. I could go away and do that on my own now. It's been so good. As carers are busy people and these are some of the most vulnerable people in society, so if we're supporting them by providing a reasonably easy method of claiming carers allowance, then that to me has got to be a good thing because that's what we're here to do. kind of three important ways of working in action here. Firstly, removing unnecessary detail and cutting things back to the bare bones. Being able to remove about 50% of questions from that process, it's pretty cool. Um, and that, a part of that is challenging the way that government policy is interpreted and translated into digital services. Um, and then using user testing and user research so that the services are built around users and user needs. And it made it better, and it saved money. Um, actually, the new service reduced ineligible claims by 41%. So that's 41% less people wasting their time applying for something that they're not eligible for, and then reducing the amount of processing that all of that stuff requires, which brought, I think, an annual saving of, what, 128 thousand pounds, it's quite a lot, um, and also as well as that, the number of claims has gone up, so from 5,000 a week to around 7,000 a week, so more people are getting the money and the support that they are entitled to from government, which is great, and there's loads, loads more stats I could go through on this, but too many to go into just now. Um, another service that we worked on uh, is the lasting power of attorney. Um, which uh, it's a it was a service built uh, by people from GDS and from the Office of the Public Guardian and the Ministry of Justice. And um, so the lasting power of attorney, you've probably got something similar here. Um, it's a legal document that uh, allows you to appoint someone else to take care of your affairs and make decisions on your behalf if you are in a position where you can't make those decisions. So if, um, if you're ill um, or if you're very elderly, um, and, and you can't ma make decisions in the time that they need to be made. Um, so, as you can imagine, it's a really important service, and it's often um, interacted with at times of great stress, and, um, and, and, and it can be very daunting to the people who are interacting with it, because it's a very important thing to do. Um, so we wanted to make it as easy as possible for users. Um, so, hopefully this video will work. Um, this is what one user thinks of the service that we built. I'm 67 and I've done the last in the power of attorney for my, for my mother. My mum's grasp on uh, modern day living as it was, was a bit limited so it was decided then that I would pay all the bills, sort everything out for her. Three years ago I had a, a stroke and you start thinking about your own mortality and you start thinking about, well, if something had have happened to me, then how would mum have coped? What would have happened? Anyway, looking on the internet and I literally stumbled across the government site for the lasting power of attorney. Started to look at it and I thought, this is good. 
because you can download all the paperwork yourself. You don't need a solicitor. And the instructions that went with each section of the lasting power of attorney, were, they were in proper people speak, not in legal jargon. So it was very easy for me to follow it. If I can do it, anybody can do it, you know. It, it's easy. The written instructions, you just can't go wrong. And I would say now to anybody, don't be frightened. Don't worry about going to see a solicitor. Do it yourself. I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad I did it when I did it. And, uh, and my mum's really pleased. And can I say thank you? Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody involved in doing the website because it's given me peace of mind and I'm sure it gives a lot of people peace of mind and my friend now is doing that and you've made it so simple and so easy for, for anybody to do and I just hope that anybody who sees this film please do it and you'll feel so relieved afterwards you know it's it's great to know that the people that you care for everything's looked after for them thank you oh, always makes me cry that one <laughs> oh. i still find this touching up i've seen this so like, many times yeah oh, need a moment Carry so, on. <laughs> so the, uh, these were just two examples um, of two very successful examples from the transformation program. Um, and there were many, many, many more. Uh, but as this dashboard shows, um, we didn't finish all these 25 pro uh, projects live, or like managing to get them live uh, by the end of the program. So some were delayed for like certain, certain reasons. But um, for example, like if something is in beta, it's still accessible um, for citizens. So it's a good, very good thing. Um, in any case, we learned a huge amount of things um, at that time. Um, so throughout the transformation program, um, we actually gained a new understanding how digital services work, uh, because it's not just about like digitalizing paper forms, but like rethinking the entire thing. Um, and there were like, most importantly, we saw that there were. Um, patterns um, of repeated effort um, appearing. So like different departments were trying to work on similar problems, um, but basically they were doing them in isolation. And the solutions um, they built were basically only used once. So this meant that each time a department uh, wanted to launch a new service, they had to build all the components, all the components from scratch, which doesn't make sense, right? Um, so we started looking more closely at components and platforms, um, and this min, uh, meant um, not looking um, at government as a series of silos where each is responsible for um, only their services need, but government basically as a series of interconnected and reusable components. Um, and each component does one thing extremely well, so just like verify and pay and notify. Um, and each of these components are free to use for everyone in government. Um, and basically, this is always the intent, um, because Guff UK as well was imagined as a platform for publishing. Um, and after the transformation project um, sort of finished, we really um, started thinking about all the different aspects of this, of this notion of a platform. So this is basically how government as a platform was born. It's a GDS program that provides like shared things um, to help departments building services, and it makes it easier and um, essentially cheaper to run. Um, and yeah, um, apart from this pay, notify, um, um, and verify, we have as well um, lots of design toolkits and design patterns, interaction design patterns, service design patterns, um, design elements, like small bits, like type, and so on. Um, and this helps making um, consistent government digital services. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, we work as well on um, common data things. So this is um, um, a snapshot 
um, of our country register. Basically, it's a list of all countries in the world. Um, and previously, each department had their own list. They were maintaining this list, trying to keep them updated. They were, they were not up to date. Things were missing, things were wrong. But now there's just one central list. So everybody knows where to go to um, to find the official name of Estonia. And actually, the other day, I was looking for the ISO code of Estonia. I thought like, it might be EE, but I was quickly checking and found it like, straight away. And as well, it contains um, a column for when um, a country like, started to exist. So you have your date of birth, if you like. <laughs> um, so the work that GDS has done so far and the problems that we found sort of brought us to our next big challenge um, and the thing that we're both focused on, which is end-to-end -end service design in government. Um, the definition of a service is really simple. It's something that helps someone to do something, uh, but government doesn't make it that easy for users to under understand their services, because historically, government has sees services as really discrete transactions that are very siloed away from each other, that the user has to figure out how to navigate through in a particular way, but the departments are talking together or making that process work smoothly or easily. Um, so things really aren't that clear to users. So, so services look a bit like this, RID or government, they love an acronym as well, um, especially if it involves a pun. Um, so RID or, um, so this is a document that requires employers to report serious accidents at work. Uh, the employer ownership pilot, brackets EOP. Uh, this is a fund open to employers to help them invest in their workforce. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, I have to read it out. Request for a further search under Section 17.6 or payment for a supplementary certificate under Section 17.8. Any clues? No. It's, a, it's, about, uh, it's an action related to getting a patent for something, apparently. Um, uh, this I will kill eventually. It's one of my missions. Um, this is the statutory off-road vehicle notification. So any British people in the audience might recognize this. Sawn. It's horrible. It's basically how you tell government you want to take your car off the road and stop paying tax on it. It's not a thing. Just stop paying tax on it. Um, <laughs> um, you know, but, but users don't see services like this. They see them in the context of things that they want to do, like start a business, or buy a car, or employ someone, or look after children. Um, simple. Um, to a user, services are really simple, and they're verbs. They're around doing things. They're not nouns that government has created to categorize things into silos. And we say good services are verbs, and bad services are nouns, and we need to create more good services. Um, so we're starting that work now, and it's the next big challenge for us. Um, so now we're going to talk a bit about how we do it. Exactly. So we've been showing you a couple of things, and this is sort of like um, a sneak peek behind the curtain, um, and what it's like to be a designer in government. Yeah. So design is a reasonably new discipline in government, but now there are quite a lot of us. Um, and they don't all work for GDS, so currently we are a bit more than 300 designers across all governmental departments um, providing services for users. And I think it's about like only 10% yeah. of the designers working in GDS. Yeah. All the other designers are in all the other departments across um, the entire country. And um, although we work in different um, multidisciplinary teams on different projects, we're all part of the same community. Um, and we get together quite regularly. So this is a picture from um, our cross-government design meeting. We have the next one, I think, next Monday. I think so, yeah. Um, um, and like in this photo, um, we, we, we um, discuss things. We always have like um, a theme. This was the theme of accessibility. Oh, so I think the good. next one will be about language. Yeah. Um, that, that's going to be interesting. Um, and um, in the time between, we continuously um, have a conversation, communicate through Google Groups and Slack, basically all the day, yeah. Slack. <laughs> um, so um, everybody can feel uh, being part of a, of a, of a bigger community. Um, and if somebody has a question, basically the person can get an answer within 15 minutes or so. Like Somebody's answering that and like, can point to, to a good example of whatever. Um, so everybody um, can learn from each other. 
Um, and the way designers work in government uh, can be quite a bit different um, compared to how designers work elsewhere, like in the private sector. Um, and here's how we work. So first of all, we, we build things. Um, and there are actually um, a couple of things you shouldn't say to a designer in government. One is double diamond. Yeah. So all the service yeah. designers among <laughs> you might know what a double diamond is. Um, and another word you should avoid is innovation. Um, so we don't talk jargon, we are mostly too busy doing things um, and um, we don't actually talk um, about work uh, that haven't started yet. We, we, we fix stuff, we continuously work on things, making, making stuff better. And all of our designers can code, at least a little bit. I'm learning. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, um, but that's because we have to understand the material that we're working with. And the material that we're working with is mostly the internet. Um, and we don't make wireframes for that reason. We have front-end developers in all of our teams, and we'll often pair with front-end devs to build stuff and prototype things but we don't draw big wireframe diagrams. We build directly in code. And we make this coding thing quite easy because we have um, a prototyping kit where you have components, yeah. so it's, it's, very, it's very easy to code in government, to be honest. Luckily for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then user research is a separate um, exercise and a separate um, expertise. So contrary, um, of, uh, contrary, contrary to much of the rest of the design industry, uh, we have like separated user research and design. Um, so they work together in teams very closely, mm -hmm. um, but um, we think that understanding every citizen's needs is a full-time job. Yeah. Um, and equally, when you're designing at this scale, um, you shouldn't be do both design and, and research. And all of our designers are expected to spot problems and try and fix them. Um, Louise Down, who's head of design uh, for government, uh, recently said that she gets really worried if people say that the designer in their team is really nice and really helpful and really supportive of all the work. No, it, 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 we, we should, we're not there to make people feel good about what they're doing. We're there to like incessantly ask questions and get a bit annoying. And like one of our favorite questions is, but what's the user need? Um, we ask that a lot. Um. <laughs> and in the first video, I mean, um, the guy talked about how they were able to cut out um, 50% of all the questions, yeah. and this is what you can only achieve if you ask rigorously, why, 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 why is yeah. this there? Why do we need this? Um, so what kind of designers do we, do we actually employ? So in government, we've been splitting design into four distinct roles. Uh, we've, uh, we've been creating these specialisms because we operate at massive scale, serving 60 million people, hmm. and no person can be good at everything. Um, having said that, um, there's no right way to be a designer, so there are all kind of different qualities and traits and like flavors. Mm. Um, and these are the four uh, roles we have. Service designers, this is basically us. So service designers design services, quite obvious. Um, <laughs> but they do it from end to end and from back to front across all channels, involving sometimes as well paper or call centers, mm. these kind of things. So in government, uh, much of this is focused on redesigning existing services, um, less creating new ones. Um, and most government services are basically a collection of isolated transactions and activities. Um, and many of them actually predate the internet because it's a thousand year old country. <laughs> yeah. So services were provided for a very long time. Right? And a lot of the work our service designers um, do is piecing together all the fragments of service and working out um, how that service needs to change in order to serve citizen needs. Now we also have interaction designers and they are there to design the detailed actions that users need to complete in order to use a service. Um, so it's, it's not just UI, but it might be like the spacing of uh, or the pacing of questions within a service or figuring out where a login should happen or if login is even necessary. Um, so they refine and shape the user journeys and focus on removing complexity where it isn't needed. And then we have graphic designers. Um, there are many graphic designers in government, but they actually play 
a crucial role. Yeah. Uh, so graphic design for us is an enabler for content and interaction design um, by basically influencing how users understand, interact with information. So that they're, they're much about like hierarchies and structure, um, like headlines and um, copy tags. Um, so developing simple information hierarchy really ensures that content is like legible and easy to read and that interactions are like well understood. And we also have content designers, which I didn't really know about as was a thing before I joined GDS, but they are massively important. They deal with words, and words are hugely important. I mean, if you look at GovUK without words, it's just a black line and a blue line and then a white box. There um, no pictures. <laughs> there's no pictures. Well, there are some, but very few. Um, so, and, and they work to, to communicate complex things as simply as possible in plain language that users can understand. When you've got a national reading age of nine, you need to, to say things simply. Um, and the vast majority of our services are made up of words, so it's important to get those words right. And you might have realized there are no UX designers. Um, so um, these roles um, are based on what a designer is designing um, and not um, about the effect uh, that they might have. So this is really why we do not have user experience designers, um, because we believe that user experience is everyone's responsibility. Um, and for example, if there's a problem with your service that the page is like loading too slow, um, and well, the UX team can't change that, um, basically they aren't control of, in control of the user experience, and no. therefore they shouldn't be called the user experience team. Simple as that. So all of our designers work in an agile fashion in multidisciplinary teams um, to iterate, to change, to improve. Um, when we started GDS, agile was not a new idea by any means. It was widely used in the private sector, but it was new to government, um, which had as we said previously, relied on commissioning big stuff from third parties. And our new agile approach really turned that on its head. So we, we went from something like this, like a sort of waterfall method, where you spend, you, you proc procure two years of, of work that by the time it's finished, it's no longer meeting uh, policy. Uh, it's not using, uh, it's not using up-to-date technology, and therefore it's really no longer meeting user needs. Um, to this, Agile, um, and we use Agile because government services need to be able to respond quickly to policy change and to the changing needs of citizens. Um, Agile lets you make changes quickly and relentlessly focus on user needs. And also key to our approach are our design principles, um, and they basically guide everything we do and how we do it. Um, there are only 10 of them. Uh, but they're hugely important to us, and they're worth reading out in full. So the first one is start with needs, because um, if you don't know what the user needs are, well, you won't be building the right thing. Um, so do your research, analyze data, talk to users, observe them, just don't make assumptions. and mm -hmm. um, Have empathy for users, and remember that sometimes what they ask for is not really what they need. Number two is do less. So government should only do what only government can do. Um, if we found a way of doing something that works, we should make it reusable and shareable. We shouldn't always be reinventing the wheel every time. And we should always all focus on the irreducible core. Do as less as possible. We design with data. So in most cases, we can learn from the real world behavior uh, by looking at how existing services are used today. Um, so we let um, data-driven decision-making and not just, uh, not just hunches and guesswork. Um, so like looking at what people actually typing into their search. So we learn a lot from Google and then calling it um, the thing um, users call it. Um, number four is do the hard work to make it simple. Because, well, making something look simple is pretty easy, but making something that is simple to use is much harder, especially when the underlying systems are really complex. Um, but that's what we should be doing, and that's a lot of what we're doing as service designers. Um, we don't take the, it's always been that way uh, for an answer. We challenge it 
to make it simple. And you hear this quite regularly if you go to some departments oh, and yeah. it's like, ah, oh, but no, let's, no. let's, let's dig deeper. <laughs> and then iterate, and then iterate again. So the best way to build a good service is to start small and iterate wildly. I mean, you probably all know that. Yeah. As preaching we to prototype, the choir. <laughs> um, yeah, preaching to the choir. Um, so we test with actual users and iterate. This really reduces risk and it makes big failures unlikely and it turns like small failures rather into, into um, lessons. And if a prototype is not working, well, we scrap it and start again. And for Verify, for example, this one component, um, we had over 100 um, lab sessions. So they're, they're testing the hell out of the thing mm -hmm. to make it better because it's one component um, being used in hundreds of services eventually. Yeah. So it has to be rock solid. Point six, this is for everyone. Like accessible design is just good design. Um, and everything we build should be inclusive of, of all kinds of people. It should be legible, it should be readable. Um, uh, because actually the, most of the people that use uh, and that need our services are often the people that find them hardest to use. Um, so we think about those people from the start. It's the people at the ends of the bell curve. And if you're getting it right for those people, then it's gonna be better for these people as well in the middle. Point seven, understand context. Because um, we're not designing for the screen, we're designing for people, right? So we have to think hard about the context in which they're using our services. Mm -hmm. um, are they in a library, are they in a bus? Is it like shaky and they have to go through like long forms or like many, many pages of a form? Um, are they only familiar with Facebook maybe? Um, so have they, have they maybe never even used the web before? It has to be simple as that. Point eight is build digital services, not websites. So, so it's our job to uncover user needs and then design the service that meets those needs. And of course, a lot of that will be web pages, but we're not here to build web websites um, because the digital world has to be connected to the real world and it has to bring all of those th all the aspects of the service together in a way that makes sense. So the letters, the call centers, it all needs to be coherent and the digital is the thread. Point nine, be consistent, not uniform. So we use the same language and the same design patterns whenever it's possible, wherever it's possible. Um, and this helps really people getting familiar with our services. But when this is not possible, we make sure that our approach is at least consistent. So and we had some, some good examples where it was about, I think, um, Verify. Um, and somebody's like, oh, I, I, I'm not really sure like what's happening and that I have to um, intro my um, or like prove my identity in this way. But it's Gov UK. I've been using this before, and yeah. the other services were really great. So I trust this thing because I recognise it. And lastly, but by no means least, uh, make things open. It makes things better. We share what we're doing whenever and however we can. We share with colleagues, we share with users, we share with the world, um, we share our code, we share designs, we share ideas, we share failures. Uh, because the more eyes that are on a thing, the more it's challenged to get better and the better it will get. Um, also, much of what we're doing is only possible because of the generosity of other people on the internet with open source code um, from the web design community. So we should give some of that back. And at some point, like we had, we had a, we had a um, startup, a, health, a, re a healthcare related startup uh, the other day coming around and mm. they said like, oh, we've been, we've been building our thing based, based on your principles. And this is like so amazing to see, right? <laughs> it's like, wow, that's big. So um, the design principles are a huge part of our culture and we want to finish um, off by telling you a bit more about our work culture and like how design supports that. So at, at GDS, teams are working on really hard problems um, and um, smart people are doing quite challenging things. Um, so it's very important that we create a culture um, that really helps them doing that. Um, and part of this culture uh, is basically creating an environment that everybody feels comfortable in so we have a very active women group, we have an LGBT group, um, and here in this picture we're putting up um, rainbows um, on our office windows for Pride earlier this year. They're never coming down, they look great, also they're very sticky. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and another part um, is helping people um, feel really proud of their work and what they're doing. So um, every team at GDS has mission patches, 
um, that mark achievements um, of, their, of the projects they're working on. So each program basically um, has a different animal. So we've been using tigers and pigeons and gorillas and otters. And at some point, we might run out of animals. Getting quite competitive now and also quite obscure. We've moved on to deep sea creatures. <laughs> but <laughs> and in general, we are quite fond of stickers overall. Everybody loves stickers. And we also love posters. Um, big words printed big on bright colored paper and stuck on the wall. Um, we have a Tumblr, govdesign.tumblr.com. Com? Yes. Yes. Um, where you can see all of our posters and you can download them and then you can have them on your walls too. Um, this is one we did recently, which makes me a bit choked up when I see it. Um, it makes me very proud to work at GDS. Um, it's talking about our office culture at GDS and it was, it was there to tell new starters the things that they should probably know about working at GDS that probably aren't in the handbook. Things like, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to forget things and ask or ask what an acronym means. Uh, it's even okay to sing at your desk if you feel like it, or sigh really loudly when things are difficult. Um, and it, what, this was on, twi it, on Twitter, it went viral. It was bonkers, and it's recently also been published as a center fold spread in a magazine. Um, it's and great. it was on Reddit, it was really big on Reddit, and someone wrote like, this is way too good to be true. I don't believe that. It is that. true. <laughs> So uh, it's really important to us that we create an open culture um, where people are comfortable talking about the things that they're doing and the challenges that they face. Um, everything we do is for government and it's for citizens. Um, and being open hopefully means that citizens understand what we're doing and the rest of government understands what we're doing so that we can all work together to uh, towards our shared goal, which is transforming government together. Thank you. Thanks. Round of applause, please, for Kate and Martin. Stay there, guys. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I've got a few Twitter questions. One thing that was coming through in the Twitter, I think, was we were talking that all designers need to know how to code, right? Let's not just do white, let's actually make something. What about the opposite? How far down the line I mean, you guys are working on the front end all the way to services. We've got mm -hmm. an API, the service backbone, and then probably on the other end, you've got these uh, legacy systems, as you talked about from years and years ago. God knows what is going on with those systems. How far back does the design influence come into that? What do you mean, how back? Well, like, how far? I mean, if you're going through the, the service API, and then you've got the guys on the other end working what? on God knows yeah. what, Oracle, old database thing. How far are you pushing into that with design thoughts? This is really what we're trying to figure out at the moment. I mean, service design, as we said, it looks at that back to front. So mm. we go in and investigate what on earth is going on and where we can. We look at what we can replace. Um, but there's a new program that's kicking off, which is called the services program, and it's really looking at these things. So nowhere is out of bounds, really. Mm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but if the question is, is about like how, how, uh, how far we're coding, for us coding is building prototypes. Yeah. So this is the thing. And then we, we very closely work with front-end devs, like doing, doing the, the real shippable code. So we won't ever like um, produce shippable code, um, if yeah. this was as well an aspect of the question. Sort of, I guess, yeah. is once you get past the service API level, it's like mm. how much are those people thinking about the design? Oh, oh, okay. So yeah, this is what what Kate said, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. so, so everybody is really like living living up to this mantra. So like everybody's embracing yeah. it. So sure. so our developers like click like, sit there. It's like okay, I don't really understand what the user need is. And like <laughs> yeah. this is the moment where like yes, everybody's on board, and this just just feels so good. Okay, so it does sound like even down to those. I mean, oh, if you yeah, think yeah, about yeah, the guys, yeah. the basement coding. Uh, the legacy system, even yeah. those guys are getting into it. And they're not in the basement, we're sitting right <laughs> next to them <laughs> every day. And so designers <laughs> do not sit in a, in a design area, yeah, sure. so every designer is embedded in an agile team. Yeah. So this is, this is key, we and think. I think an, another sort of point on that is that it's not just the designers that work with user researchers. Mm -hmm. 
everyone has to go and do user research. So we have a policy that um, you have to spend at least two hours every six weeks engaged in user research. Mm -hmm. So even if you're a back-end developer in a team, you are there listening to the real experiences of users in their house using the thing that you're building. It's really important. What would that be? Like you've, you've made some, some studies or something and they've got a video they can watch or how does someone get this information? They, well, they the go user, and user, participate. Yeah, yeah. In, in the lab. So we have a mm -hmm. lab, dedicated lab, and the developers yeah. like will just join a session for a day every six weeks or so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. that is very interesting. How do you feel about, I mean, uh, uh, the, the government, any government doesn't have a good reputation for agility, and <laughs> governments have a reputation for protecting their own back, for not wanting people to meddle in their own thing. Have you encountered this kind of resistance as you're going through many different departments? Yes. Being as diplomatic <laughs> as you can. <laughs> I mean, some, sometimes it is hard, right? And change it's, is it hard changes and hard. scary. Mm. Because like, it's sometimes it's, it's related to like, loss of power, right? right? So you have to make sure that, that, that people feel empowered and then they start embracing the new, but mm. they have to understand what's in for them, what's the value. Yeah. Right. And once you, you, you work together and like, building things together, there's a, there's a, there's a, shared, there's a shared ownership. And yeah. then things like, start moving way faster. Sure. Which is why things like government technology is really important because we're not just doing things for citizens, but we're also giving civil servants the tools for them. as well. Yeah. So it sounds like not, it's not just the minister sort of saying, do this, and then everyone <laughs> no sort way. of has to do it. When you're, you've yeah. got this yeah. collaborative approach where you're sort of being very hands-on and saying, we're not going to you know, steal your stuff, guys. We're not trying to yeah. you know, take anything away from you. And I, no. To me, I, that sounds like that would take a lot of time just in itself to go yeah. around and do you that. You don't want to yeah. fight against anyone. You want to you want to fight with them for for the better thing. So this is why yeah. we say transform government together. So the together yeah. is the key the key piece. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, everyone in this room, mostly Estonians, no doubt, through the whole talk, comparing themselves to the <laughs> E-Estonia solution and, and all the things we do. Do you have any thoughts to relate that to the Estonian experience uh, with building their e-services platform and have you learned something from them or what's some comparisons there? So I've been meeting um, um, a colleague from the Estonian government I think a couple of, a couple of months ago and it was quite interesting to, yeah. to see what they're working on and like, even licensing to the Finns was like wow this, like, this yeah. is really government as a platform, as That's a core thought, it's quite amazing. Um, is there I one thing that so I've been using um, the the e residency service myself? Mm -hmm. I, I I know a friend who, who has he's a Frenchman and he's running his business from France right. um, in Estonia and it's it's so he's <laughs> paying his taxes here and, and and he was he was like, look at this thing I have this card reader and this all works <laughs> it was quite amazing to see. Is there something you think Estonia does that you would like to emulate? Um, I think we're gonna have hopefully some discussions yeah. later this okay, afternoon, yeah. and we have to have more exchange. So we're really yeah. curious to learn how this is happening. But there is an ongoing initiative. Um, yeah. It's called the D5 initiative, where the Estonian government, the New Zealand government, UK government, and a few other governments are con continuously working together. So there is an ongoing e exchange between the governments. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Very good. Okay, we're out of time for any more questions. Yes. Please, one more round of applause for Martin and Kate. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.